Hello, I'm John Brink and we are podcasting on the brink from downtown Prince George, the capital of Northern British Columbia, as I call it, an absolute beautiful province, beautiful day in Prince George. And uh, we have a very, very special guest today, very interesting guest with a very, very interesting background. And we'll be talking about that, uh, about Peter. We have a lot of things, Peter Woodbridge, we have a lot of things in common, amazingly, for many, <laughs> many years. And we'll talk about that, including being authors. Peter, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. Much appreciated. Lovely, lovely to be here. Lovely to see you again. Yeah. And Prince George is looking great. Uh, you know, it's, it's changing all the time. It is an amazing area here, and you've been very familiar with it for the last yeah. 60 years, yeah. indirectly, yeah. indirectly, yeah. is, uh, yeah. you know, that I always looked at Prince George as uh, when I first came here in 1965, it was a boom town. Yeah. The question was always, when did you get here and when are you leaving? It was a place <laughs> to make money and then leave again, oh, right? <laughs> So let's talk about a little bit about your background. Uh, you know, do you, you were born in England. Right. And, and then where we have something in common is that I left school when I was 14 yeah. and you left school when you were 15 yeah. and then started again and turned it into an amazing career with Thank you. <laughs> lots of credentials and it brought you all around the world. So let's yeah. start, start out in England. Uh, yeah. Um, Brought up in England, uh, Northern England, actually. My dad was uh, stationed in Northern England at the end of uh, WW2. Okay. And so he took the family up there. But basically, our family comes from <clears throat> an area west of London, uh, Reading, you might know it, uh, yeah. and Berkshire. Yeah. Uh, that's where our family comes back from several hundred years. And uh, so moving on from that, uh, schooled in, in England. Uh, dad uh, sent us to really nice schools. Uh, he was... Uh, Typical entrepreneur, came from East London. He's a Cockney, um, went through some tough times himself. His dad died when he was, I think, two, and his mum died when he was six. Yeah. Whole story there. Yeah. But he was an entrepreneur, and like you, you know, full yeah. of energy and, yeah. and wants to go places. Um, family fortunes up and down, you know, over the years. He, 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 one time he had a stable. Typical entrepreneur, right? Exactly. Four horses, stable alongside the house and all that stuff. Other times, not so good. Right. And towards about uh, when I was about 15, uh, when I left school, as you said, um, my dad had been in and out of hospital for about five years, in and out, you know, professional managers running the company. Didn't go well. He, um, he went bankrupt and then a week later died. And so we Ooh. had pretty tough circumstances. So I was, How old were you then? When um, I, I was just 16 when, uh, yeah. When so, he passed away? Yeah, when he passed away. So, Very yeah. suddenly? Or? No, because he had a, a series of heart attacks and okay. uh, there's a story in that, but yeah, uh, yeah. we'll leave that one. The, uh, the point being that uh, my mum, uh, three sisters, my oldest sister was in the uh, Four forces. siblings, all to, uh, three other siblings, including yourself. Four. Right, and I was number two, so. Yeah, okay. Little boy. And, um, so I, I, I left school. Uh, so my first real job, I took a couple of small jobs before, but my first real job was with British Rail at the time that Dr. Beeching was going through. Being a clerk, right? A clerk, yeah, booking yeah. clerk. Exactly yeah. that. I had no qualifications. I mean, I yeah. straight out of school. So um, uh, Dr. Beeching was doing his uh, cutting of the railways from the old steam trains, but I fell in love with steam trains. You, f you fell in I, love with them. Uh, <laughs> but amazing, right? They are gorgeous things. I still, yeah. you know, I'm a train aficionado, so. Yeah. Um, I, I decided pretty soon that, uh, first of all, we needed money in the family because my dad had gone bankrupt. We didn't have anything. We were counting pennies, frankly, uh, literally. And, uh, what year would it have been, Peter? So that was now 62, 63. 63, yeah. Early 60s. And yeah. uh, tough times. Uh, winter in 63 was a huge, tough winter in, in the UK. Right. And we had trouble even getting fuel for the fires for the house. We lived in a big old house. And right. Tough time. So, uh, two younger sisters, still at school, very young, and a sister in the forces. You, you were more or less the man in the f of the family then, yep. working closely with your mom. Yeah, because right? she, she went back to uh, school, went to university for a year, uh, you know, and, and I helped her. So, the main focus is you know, family survival. But right. at the same time, I thought, well, I've got to get some qualifications, go back and get them. So, I started doing uh, night shift work. I worked for... Vauxhall Motors uh, in the UK, that's uh, like General Motors, and uh, worked a lot of night shift work there. And um, 
that was good income uh, for the family, but also did uh, day school or night school, depending on what I could do, and built up those precious O levels and A levels that you need to uh, yeah, yeah. to get to. That was level. recognized already well in place that you could do that at night school? Yeah, it was. I, I went to a, a, a Catholic boys' school, uh, okay. and you know, from age eight. Yeah, uh, you know, very restrictive that kind of thing. So to right. me, frankly, to escape from that for, for right. a religious school to uh, a secular school system was wonderful. It's fantastic, and right. uh, I really thrived on that. I love places like BCIT because that's the kind of system I went through. Yeah, yeah. So. And and then uh, you know, so what you did is you got uh, a bachelor of science in agriculture economic. Uh, uh, development from the University of Reading, mm -hmm. and the, and then followed by a Master's of Science in Business Administration from the University of Bradford. Yeah, these are very credible, uh, uh, highly profiled organizations. John, can you imagine going from that recent background to a place like university where they, you know, you get a scholarship, you have more money than you ever had before. <laughs> I played rugby for the university, which is fantastic. We had a secret society there called the Yeoman Society, so, you know, in the top echelons of the social scene. Very small university. We used to be a college of Oxford at one time, but um, really great fun. So I had an absolute ball, absolute great, except that the tragedy in the family continued. I don't want to bore your <laughs> listeners with all no, this. No, no, well, that's, that's why I have you here. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I, we want to know. So second <clears throat> year of uh, university, <clears throat> Sorry, second term of university, um, family tragedy, two sisters were killed in a car accident. So all of a sudden, even my studies were broken up because I had a motorbike. I used to travel 200 miles home every weekend, gave up my rugby for a time and all that stuff. And so um, my mum, you know, obviously very upset and, and, and tra traumatized by this. So I spent a lot of time with her trying to settle her back into to things. So. But then I graduated uh, uh, from, from Reading and uh, got a scholarship to uh, uh, post Bradford. Bradford. Yeah, to Bradford. And uh, really loved it there. From there, went down to... How long was your studies at Bradford? Uh, well, uh, basically three years because I was actually doing a PhD. Yeah. But I decided after a time that I really wasn't a PhD candidate in the sense I didn't want to be at university smoking a pipe all my life, so right. a bit more practical than that. So, yeah, exactly. Um, so I did a master's instead, an MBA uh, type thing. So I did a master's uh, thesis. So I was there for about two years, and then I went down to the city of London, um, worked for a company in the city of London, um, which is a very interesting company. It was what we called in those days an overseas trader. They had uh, it was a company that had uh, 60 different operating companies um, in 30 different uh, countries. Um, so they were in Africa, they were in Europe, extensively in South America. That was America. not Dalgetty, right? No, that wasn't Dalgetty. That was called Balfour Guthrie. And uh, very well known, very well respected, highly respected. So, so the company that you went to in, in London was not Dalgetty, was another company? Yes, it's Balfour Guthrie. But I got to know Dalgetty because it's one of the things that I later in the capital markets as a stock analyst used to cover that, so I got to know the Dalgetty people, and that's the connection with yeah, Alpha and, Guthrie. Yeah, and this is so interesting. We'll, we'll come back to this one in a minute. I just want to kind of look at your track and then my track, yeah. is that, uh, uh, you know, again, you had trauma in your life that, uh, same, same, uh, exactly you know, same. same as mine, uh, because I was born in 1940, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, uh, my mom had three kids. Uh, I was the youngest, my sister one year old, my brother yeah. two years older. And my dad was, uh, 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 April of 1940, had to go into the Dutch army. And the last time they heard from him was the, uh, before the bombing of Rotterdam. Yeah. So the, for yeah. five years, they didn't know if he was dead or alive. Gosh. And then they, uh, it was a difficult, difficult time, and, mm -hmm. and I still remember from the time that I was three and a half, you know, these bombers overhead, uh, hundreds of bombers. The sound of it, I, I use it in my presentations, we both are public professional speakers as well, mm -hmm. amazingly, yeah. <laughs> for me, and we'll come to that story as well. But in any event, then, you know, talking about the sound of 
hundreds of bombers, 200, 300 bombers in the air, is something yeah. that I still remember, but I've never heard it again. Likely, likely will never hear it again. Yeah, thank God. And, yeah. and, uh, but yeah. it created a love for flying from me for some yeah. strange reason. Yeah. But a lot of times what we would be doing, we were living in northeastern Holland, within 20 minutes from the border of Germany, and my, my mom would take us out not because to, it was so interesting to see, because we felt safer mm -hmm. to be outside than mm -hmm. inside. Yeah. And we had a flat roof that looked towards Germany. We could see, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the northwestern part of Germany, yeah. where Kiel, Hamburg, yeah. Wilhelmshaven, and all those areas were being bombed. Yeah. And yeah. we could see the flames and all of that uh, in the distance. The whole sky would be around. And it's ironic, John, that, uh, you know, Having gone through that, today we have friends, neighbors who are German. We know one of my kids, one of my sons, went over to Germany for three, uh, five years, in fact, and studied over there. Um, you, you know, the world has changed so much since then, but you do have these memories yeah. that are formative and very, very uh, important in your life. And, and the way I always kind of look at that, my, uh, I was married twice. My yeah, first wife yeah. was German. Yeah. And, and so uh, we, I always kind of look at this, we were all victims, you yes. know, on either yeah, yeah, side, yeah, yeah. you know, in any event, the, uh, yeah. so I remember that part. And then uh, obviously uh, the, the winter of 20, 1944, 45 yeah. was the hunger winter. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. our kids would go out every morning <clears throat> with gunny sacks into the railroad yards, finding anything edible and burnable. All those things somehow. I'm going to tell you a little story, if I could in interject here. Yeah. Uh, when I was at Balfour, there was a, a Dutch guy there. Uh, and uh, uh, Dick Van Randen, I don't know if you've ever met uh, Dick, but I remember going out to the pub when I first arrived in the evening. We went for a drink and uh, we ordered some fish and chips for you know, dinner. And, and I remember leaving part of my food and Dick was livid, absolutely livid that I would waste food. Yeah. And he didn't insist that I ate it, but you know, and I, I learned from that, you know, and I knew all about what the Dutch people went through, especially yeah. in 45, but you know, right throughout the war. It's amazing, you know, how <laughs> wasted your food, you know. And he was eating bulbs and, you know, other things during the wartime. You know, absolutely amazing what you guys went through. Exactly. Okay. You know, and, and uh, a, a, a lot of young kids died, a lot of old people yep. died during that hunger winter. You know, I would also link up with, I was in Ethiopia for a year, uh, working in cotton plantation. Okay. I'll come to that very soon. But the same thing, I was there during the famine. Yeah. And we can come back to that later on. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so then, coming to my school, or my academic yeah. <laughs> uh, part of my life is that, so there was areas of uh, PTSD, no question about it, and then the inner child. Actually, I got uh, counseling for that in my late 50s even. Uh, we had some issues be in uh, between uh, my wife, myself, that's very common. We sought counseling and it all worked out well. We've yeah, been yeah. together for 40 years plus. And uh, anyway, so then the counselor said that uh, to us, I want to talk to John about the inner child. I had really no idea huh. what it was about. And so I, counsel, yeah. I, I met with him then uh, several sessions, very emotional really, and, and talking about that little boy that never really left. Very emotional, very, very helpful. And I talk about that quite open and quite mm. publicly. Uh, mm. You know, it's mm. all in my books as well. You know, so, but in any event, then school for me didn't work well. So I failed grade three and I failed grade seven three times. Yeah, yeah. And then they said, what are we going to do with this guy? Send him to the mentally challenged school or do we get him a job? <laughs> Fortunately, and my parents were beautiful yeah, people, yeah. fortunately they got me a job yeah. because my grandfather was a master carpenter. He died early, but I knew him through his work that he did. Yeah, yeah. And my dad managed a small little lumber company for one uh -huh. of the biggest uh -huh. importers of Western Europe, William yeah. Pond, still there actually. And, yeah. uh, and uh, so my career would be in lumber. So yeah, he said, yeah. let's train him as a furniture maker. So yeah, I did yeah, that. Yeah. And then in the night school, I would go to become a furniture maker and work during the daytime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then I got a career similar to yours. And that's why I mm -hmm. know uh, that yeah. my studies really became 
yours were different and the normal thing if I look at your bi biography and we understand it better once we know your background was circumstantial things happened that f that put you in a direction where you ended up to be right. what you are today and what you were doing your career. The same happened to me in a different way that I always had this hunger for knowledge uh, you know, and, and so I saw yeah, it in different right, places. Yeah, if yeah. I heard about speakers, even in my 14, 15 years old, yeah. I really always thought about and listened to the people that were very successful in different areas. Yeah. And, uh, but I kind of felt then, uh, you know, I wanted to, we were liberated by the Canadian Army and April the 12th, 1945, and I always mm. knew then <clears throat> that I wanted to go to the land of my heroes. Okay. I was trying to go <laughs> when I was 17. My parents mm. wouldn't let me, and then I was drafted into the yeah, Dutch Air yeah. Force, did that for two, yeah, two years, yeah. and then uh, worked in the Dutch lumber industry for two and a half years with a major company. Yeah. Rose through the ranks, even with the lack of diplomas, uh, uh, fairly quickly in that auditing and troubleshooting department. Was really important that it was a major importing lumber company yeah. in, uh, in Holland that had about 35 to 40 subsidiaries throughout Holland. So they had an auditing department and a troubleshoot department. Right. If there were problems in the subsidiary, they send a small team in there yeah. to yeah. help them, either management changes or problems. Uh, you know, operationally, yes. and yeah. I was part of that team. That served yeah. me well. Yes. And then, when I was 24, I thought a couple of things that were important and, and became defining really in my life is that I felt because in Holland it is always that if you want to have a family, you want to have a house, and all the other things, you have to have a good career. And if I'm trying to get a career, the first thing they say, where are your diplomas? Well, yeah. I didn't have any. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, and I kind of felt in a way that I had failed. And I then felt, I want to go to Canada, to British Columbia, built my own lumber company because I loved lumber. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and I want to start with nothing yeah, so yeah. that I could prove to myself that I could do it. Yeah. Hence, so I... Uh, John, you've more than proved it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you've more than proved it. So, yeah. so in 1965, I w came, yeah. uh, the plane to Montreal and then the train to Vancouver. And then yeah, I yeah. couldn't speak the language. I couldn't speak English. I didn't have a job, didn't know a soul. Yeah. And, and I went to the immigration office in Vancouver, met a German fellow, uh, and I could speak some German. I told him what I wanted to do. He said, Prince George. Great. That's where they're building the sawmills. That's, great. That's where the opportunities are. So and you had come out with that. <laughs> okay. I admire that. My similarities, I, I, I got married in the UK. Uh, my first wife yeah. died tragically later on, but um, we arrived in Vancouver with $600. Yeah. <laughs> Before, you know, going to Isn't to, it, to Bell for Guthrie, and, and, for and, and you say, you know, but you've got youth, and and you've got ambition, and you've got energy, your hard work ethic is there, and it really doesn't matter how much you start with. Yeah, <laughs> twenty five, forty seven, <laughs> and and precisely what you were saying, I had attitude, avoid the negative, uh, passion, have that passion, and still have that today, and and uh, work ethic. Yep. But will follow is success, yep. and I always believe that. My employees gave that to me actually, and uh, so that's how I kind of started. And then, yeah. fairly quickly, be coming to the story where I yeah. indirectly, indirectly met Peter Woodbridge. Now yeah. we are in 1965 when I came off the bus here. Yeah. There's my twenty-five dollars forty-seven cents, one suitcase, three books. Okay, which books were it, John? It was Management by Drucker, oh. Logical Thinking, <laughs> and, a, and a book about Canada. <laughs> you know? So that's where my mind was. And then when I needed a job here, and uh, so for about 10 days, somebody promised me a job, they didn't give me a job, I was sleeping yeah, yeah, out in yeah. the and all of that kind of stuff. And they were building a new mill here yeah. that had been completed in 1965, and the mill was called Netherlands Overseas. That's right. I didn't know the Dutch people or anything yeah, like, yeah. I, I was just a guy. Yeah. And so they gave me a job piling lumber. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, clean up man first, then yeah, yeah. I graduated to piling lumber, then I became a foreman, and before yeah. I knew it, uh, yeah. I was superintendent. Yeah. And, and something happened to that organization that their emotions drove the ownership of the mill, a fellow by the name of Nick Van Dremel. Yeah, yeah I came from Holland. Well. Exactly. And, and, and had a number of small yeah. mills, sold yeah, them yeah. all. Oh, yeah. And, and then emotions mm. became, he wanted to produce lumber and sell it to Holland. Yes, yeah. Well, the market was not ready for that. No, no. The uh, big export, of course, you know, was always from the coast, Douglas fir to the UK and to in, in Europe. Europe. In Europe in particular. So you, you can see the vision there, Nick Van Drummond, just to think. And it wasn't wrong. It was just a matter of timing like everything else. Investment right. and timing go together. If right. you get it right, brilliant. Yeah. And, and that's always the thing. The market is all forgiving, yeah. right? Or yeah. the opposite, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so what happened is that uh, where, uh, he had been very, very successful. Yeah. All of a sudden, uh, uh, the market turned against him. Some of the management decisions they make in terms yeah. of market access. Yeah. The market was not ready for the products that he yeah. had. There was more coastal species, not interior. And uh, the pressure came on. They appointed an, uh, uh, yeah, sure. a receiver, yeah, yeah. and uh, and and then forced a sale. Who bought the company? Well, it was Belfer Guthrie. Okay, and who are Belfer Guthrie? And you come in here in a minute. Yeah. Belfer Guthrie. Uh, was on, was bought was a San Francisco company. Right. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, and, right. and was owned. Dalgetty International bought it in 1966. Yeah. And they were into sheep and wool. Yes. Very successful in company. Australia. Still today. Yeah. 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 And they bought Balfour Guthrie. And yeah. Balfour Guthrie, a lumber wholesale company, located in Vancouver and acquired Netherlands overseas. Yes. Yes. A lot of that was to do with people like Peter Hall, Fred Owen, you remember? All of those. Peter was my boss, fantastic guy, wonderful guy. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Um, so that, what year would it have been? Uh, so that, because I came here in 74. Yeah. I did 74. And that was interesting because it was just the OPEC crisis was just starting. Yeah. So Canada had oil. <laughs> so exactly. Canada actually did well out of the mid 70s recessions that hit a lot of people a lot yeah, of countries. yeah yeah and uh so um yeah i i remember uh, you know, john whitmer i remember coming up here and, and john whitmer showing me around a lot you know kind of you know because of my background i actually had worked outside of the forest industry before coming here the forest industry my background's agricultural economics yeah so I had worked uh, for um, Belfer Guthrie, not Belfer Guthrie, uh, for Mitchell Cotts, I should say, uh, in London. I'll go back a little step, if I may. Yeah. And fascinating company. Uh, we want to talk about books a little bit. Um, uh, Mitchell Cotts was very interesting in that it had a lot of people in foreign countries, okay? And there's always a suggestion that there might have been a bit of a MI6 kind of situation where intelligence comes from companies and it happens everywhere, you know, and so on. But um, I, I, I remember that I was sent out to Ethiopia for a year to work on a cotton plantation. So and a what? A cotton plantation. So okay. that was um, basically going out right to the middle of the Danical Desert, which is a 600 foot depression. Just by what the Red organization? Sea. So, were you part then of an organization that sent you out to those different areas, or were you independent? No, um, I was an employee of, of the company, and the chairman said at lunch one day, they had a very, very nice, very elegant restaurant, top floor in the city of London, of a building there, and he said, I want you to go out to uh, Tenderhorn and look at the cotton plantation. I learned something. You talk about Drucker. Well, you learn a lot from Drucker and a lot of other people. And the chairman was fantastic because he wouldn't give me specific terms of reference. And, you know, I was part of a, a small office called the planning office. We were sent all around the world to do different things. But he, he'd say, well, just get out there and see what you think. So I asked my immediate boss, I said, what, what does the old man want? You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I don't know. He hasn't told me either. So 
<laughs> I got out there and, and first thing, you know, I met a couple of people I knew out there and, and, and they said, well, come and have some fun. I said, I can't have any fun. I've got to get work. I mean, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing here. So I've got to find out every single thing about every bit of operation I can and, and the whole right thing. Right from the ground up. Right from the ground up. So I, I was going around like crazy and they said, slow down. We don't do that here. So <laughs> I learned, you know, a very smart entrepreneur and a very smart boss will always give vague terms of reference to anyone who's really good because they'll find out and do, uh, do everything around the business that needs to be done. Right. So from there, anyway, it's kind of interesting because you know, we mentioned the famine uh, and going back to 1945 in, in, in Holland, you mentioned that before. There was a huge famine on at that time. So I was there at the time of Haile Selassie, um, very interesting yeah. times. Um, the whole area now is a, a sugar plantation. They've got a major uh, irrigation project in Ethiopia. Was then a, more or less a dictatorship under Alassi, right? Yeah, it was a feudal monarchy, never right. mind a dictatorship. Right. He was still running it in the 14th century. And, right. And, and it was horrible to see, and, and I've got lots of stories yeah. to meet again. At some point, we can talk about him. But sure. Just, um, yeah, it was really tough. We had 40 square miles of cotton, irrigation cotton. And this is a, um, the origin of this was a German guy who was a, a captured by a Saudi Arabian sheikh uh, in Jeddah during the wartime. And afterwards, he's you know, released, and, and he walked all the way across from the Red Sea right through the Danical Desert and saw the potential of the soil. You know, an agricultural economist always starts at the soil and look at the climate, the soil, and, and, and the water supply. Very seasonal water supply. You know, you can see rain clouds going across the desert, and you know, it's two days later they hit the highlands and water starts coming down. And water comes down, it starts as a trickle and very quickly becomes a flood. Everything comes down. Cattle, I've seen people drown in it, that kind of thing. It's, Anyway, th that wasn't dammed at that point in time, but they used to use um, irrigation systems, big fields, to which were flooded. Yeah, and they used to grow to cotton manage. in basically eight weeks. It was so hot, 135, 140 degrees. Right. I love heat today. It's just very fast growing cotton. That cotton is, is fab fabulous. It's like Egyptian Sudanese cotton. It's very, very high uh, quality, long staple cotton, absolutely brilliant. So. I'm dealing in cellulose. I'm dealing in cellulose here when I come to, to but it's very, very different. So very quickly coming over to, uh, to Netherlands, which is what you're talking about, uh, it was actually fascinating to me, but I was green. I, did, I knew nothing about the uh, lumber business. I remember- What year was that? 1974. Okay. When I arrived. So driving around the north uh, with people who knew things, I, you know, into the woods, I remember seeing signs <laughs> Amazing. Um, you know, I, I love hunting like a lot of people do, but I saw this sign, a four by eight sign saying, this is a moose, another one next to it, this is a, this is, this is a, this is a, this is cattle, this is, this is a cow. Okay. Yeah. And I thought to myself, you know, make sure you shoot the right one. <laughs> yeah. The signs. Yeah. Fabulous, incredible changes from European background to North America. It really was still yeah. part of the Wild West, as, as yeah. we know, the bush mills that we, we had in, in those days and so on. But Alpha Guthrie, I always thought, did really well. They had a very good trading department, which you know about. They were also based overseas in terms of the overseas department, a lot of work in Japan. Um, and uh, they were looking at whether they should continue to acquire or go into maybe retail at that time. And so uh, that was very my This is Balfour. This is Balfour. Um, and so that was my mandate from Peter Hall, is to look at the retail side, look at where strategically we should go. So, and I was then employed by Netherlands overseas and indirectly by Balfour, yep. and I was doing uh, 73, 74. Uh, uh, I was already, I was fairly close to John Whitmer on the operational side. Yep. And, that's, uh, that's how I met you. You probably don't remember this, but I remember being amazed. I was there one night for the night shift and not working on the night shift, but just, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah. observing it and, and, and learning. And I remember these beehive burners outside and people shoveling this gorgeous, you know, lumber, <laughs> which you've made into finger joint, thank goodness, sense, and, and other people as well. But, you know, just shoveling it into beehive burners and it just going up in the sky. And I thought, for someone, who couldn't find the fuel to light the fires in my early days in England, I thought, what a waste. 
You know, yeah. so all of a sudden we all start thinking, how can we use this for energy? How can we use it for something else? How can we take those trim blocks and, and, and use them? How can we get value added out of this? Right. There was, there was, there was in those days. Half kind of, the trees would go up the burner, right? <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> the land of plenty. <laughs> You see, during that period when I was working with yeah. Belfort and also indirectly yeah. with Peter Hall and the guys from Belfort, yeah. we were also looking and I did a study for them uh, in uh, Ontario and Quebec yeah. for potential acquisitions yeah. and wrote a number of reports on it and yeah, then yeah. changing the company into a new direction. Yeah. And, and it was not going in, uh, where I thought it should be going. and. Uh, uh, then I resigned from Netherlands overseas in early 1974 and wrote a, a business proposal uh, for the banks on studying a value-added company. And, and your name and value-added are synonymous. I mean, and if we fast forward, because we've got to talk about some books here, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, but um, if we fast forward, the value-added industry, you know and I know, that has gone up, you know, it's come through ups and downs, all to do with supply of timber, ultimately. And, yeah. and, and you know, that's Access to fiber. Access to fiber. And I've had many clients, uh, as you know, I work with uh, Paper Excellence for a time on the pulp side. Sure. Um, I, I think they're a tremendous company, I have to say that, you know, they, so they've come here and uh, invested very, very heavily. Uh, exactly. And mills that were closing down, closed and nobody else wanted. I, I think they've done a tremendous job. But I think going forwards, John, and you've covered this in some of your programs and with some of your guests, I think we have to start to think in terms of, as you call it, the managing of the transition. You know, no one's got a blueprint for the future. You can throw those old blueprints away. No one's got, we all have visions and then things, but the visions are gonna come from the next generation as well. The next Correct. generation of, of, of First Correct. Nations and many new people are gonna come here. Yeah. So managing those transitions is where we're at today. And uh, that's where you start writing your books, I start writing mine. You retire from one thing and you say, hey, I, I'm writing fiction, you're writing real stuff. But <laughs> yeah, so where I'm in now in my stage yeah. is that I, 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 and as you do, I'm sure, I love Canada. Yep, I, I love it. I love British Columbia. And I think it, it, we are so blessed with resources. Uh, I fly a lot, so do you. I always sit by the window. I look outside, they say, it's paradise. It's paradise. And I'm, I, you know, I'm a great believer in northern BC, but I believe there are such opportunities and then particular in natural resources and, and, uh, and, and then lumber in particular and, yeah, and yeah. fiber. So <clears throat> I'm doing, some of my programs are, uh, you know, uh, uh, you were quite involved in the lumber industry and obviously I spent my life in the for forest yeah. industry. I do the one, uh, BC forest industry and tra transition, be very much there yep. as, as we speak. But, and I write about that, I speak about that, give tip presentations about it, uh, talk to government about it in terms of direction. So, uh, still very much part of my life uh, today. Uh, then, the other part where we are, have the similarities, I've always loved writing. Amazingly, with my grade seven, <laughs> I say tongue in cheek a little bit, is that uh, I've always been a good writer yeah. and, and uh, I'm good at numbers and yeah. uh, hence my career, yeah. Which even is when you know me then. Right? Interesting combination being both good at numbers and being able to write. That's a, a yeah. Good. Well done. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so then, in my particular case, uh, you know, the, about the books that I have, yeah. all three of them, this one here, Against yeah. All Odds, yeah. you know, the uh, autobiography, and, uh, you know, and people said to me, you know, you're going to have to write about, uh, you know, your, uh, you, you have an interesting career, why don't you write about it? And so it took me 80 years to live it, 20 years to think about it, two years to write it. <laughs> and as you well know, writing books is not easy. No. And, uh, you know, and, and then an autobiography, you cannot say, okay, well, I did it. Mm, I don't like it. I'm going to do it again. No, yeah. you have one crack to do it. Do yeah. it right, you know. Yeah, and right. so, and then the other one that I did is that, because we've got so many things to cover here, yeah. so I'm just rushing a little bit here, is that 
but changed my life is that coming to Canada for one and, 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 and gaining confidence in myself that I knew I can do it and working hard and all the qualities that yeah, you need yeah, to yeah. succeed, attitude, passion, work yeah. ethic. In 1957, when I was uh, 57 years old, I walked into this store here in Prince George, picked up a book, I still don't know why, yeah. opened the book, and uh, the title of the book was Driven to Distraction. Uh. And, and it was about ADHD. And I said, that's me. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and I wrote in it, the book in Dutch, now I finally know who I am. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then I was ashamed of it initially. And it took me years and years, it took me five years to talk my, to my doc about it. And yeah. he had delivered our two daughters, yeah. he was a friend. Yeah. And five years after I read the book, I went into his office and he said, John, why are you here? And I said, I think I got ADHD. And yep. so we looked at it and we just decided I, I did have John, it. I think it was Hemingway who said, uh, to be able to write about life, you have to live it. You've definitely lived it. You know, and, and your books will reflect that experience and that wisdom and that thinking. Right. And that, that emotion and that, you know, that, that determination to... To, to do something better all the time. So. And, and to share it with others, right? Yeah. Saying yeah. that, uh, you know, that there's so many people yeah. that are, just today, I, I think it was just today, uh, I did a, a podcast uh, with uh, a, a lady that, uh, doing the podcast, I had no idea uh, when I talked about my book about ADHD, she was on virtual and she went like, <laughs> ADHD happens to be virtually yeah. on a daily basis. Uh, amazing, amazing. I'm not uh, doing nonfiction. Mine, my books are fiction. Yeah. But they take the same kind of background, the same kind of uh, thinking. And this is a story, it's a trilogy. Yeah. Uh, three books in the series now. Uh, and it is uh, basically about a, a young girl um, from Catalonia, which is uh, Barcelona, essentially the whole regional area, the separatist area yeah. around Barcelona, which you know about. Um, and I love Spain. Oh, a fantastic place. Yeah. I'd love to spend some more time talking about Spain because it's got a, a unique background. You know? yeah. It was Arabic uh, caliphate for 800 years. Exactly. And, and, and so a lot of that is reflected in here. But this is a, a fiction. It's uh, uh, a young girl who gets caught up in what uh, developed to be the largest uh, or the, the most important uh, espionage uh, case uh, in uh, recent history. Now, it's, I say it's fiction. A lot of this is based on some stories, but this is, uh, she's 17, uh, and you think, well, how can a 17-year-old girl get involved in espionage? Well, not just that, she became deep undercover. Deep undercover. Undercover is uh, basically um, an interesting word in my genre, which is spy stories, espionage, and, and, and so on. She um, has a very tragic background. She, uh, her parents are killed when she's eight, um, and her brother, younger brother. Um, she's adopted uh, by her uncle, who is head of counterterrorism in a national police in Spain. And um, the thing is that because of the background of Spain, and I, I'll just take one minute if I can. Yeah, yeah, no, no, have no go ahead. Yeah. Spain, as I say, was <coughs> excuse me, an Arab caliphate for 800 years, uh, up until Ferdinand and Isabella brought in the Reconquista, the rebirth of, of, of Christianity, the respread of Christianity and, and the Catholic religion into Spain, where they then expelled all the Jews and they expelled all the Muslims and uh, the, and and basically, you know, very interesting time. That ran through the golden years of Spain, where they then conquered parts of South America. 12th, 1300th century. A exactly, that, all the way through. Yeah. And uh, Christopher Columbus was financed by Spain, and that's how <laughs> he came to North America. Exactly. You know, so huge numbers of, of stories here. But <clears throat> essentially, um, Spain was a very protected country of monarchy uh, for a very long time. Yeah. It's only been a democracy three times, once for a few months in the 1800s, 18. 60s. <clears throat> Secondly, just before the Spanish Civil War, um, it was a, the Second Republic. Uh, that was overthrown by a group of military people, including Franco. Franco was then the dictator, as you know, for until 1974, 75. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then they've only had a constitution, a democracy, since 1978. And that's been 
touch and go a few times, there have been a coup, a few, one or two coup attempts. So a lot of these kind of background stories appear in this trilogy. But the essential plot of the story is this young girl, because her parents are killed, she finds out that her uncle is actually an Al-Qaeda sympathizer. Um, and there are reasons for that as well. And so she is groomed by him to become a spy for him and Al-Qaeda. Okay? Um, the now, Al-Qaeda is the terror organization, more or less... Uh, based in the Middle East. In the Middle East. But spread throughout the world and is yeah. still growing. Yeah. Which is important. Still active now. Still very active and still growing. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, she becomes deep undercover. Undercover is an interesting word in my genre because you either have sleeper agents who are undercover and they're, they're activated at some point by something, right. or you can have very active um, undercover agents, and this is what she was. Uh, and that's where you have to live the whole story. So when you think of stories like the spy who came in from the cold, when you talk about people like Jean Le Carré, yeah, <clears throat> he basically lived his story and that's what convinced the East German political boss, the MI6, if you like, of East Germany back in the 1960s, that, holy smokes, he, he, he did a magnificent undercover operation on this guy. Right. He, he just, I won't go into the detail, but it's a classic story. Um, it, it really is one of the best stories. If you want to write in this genre, read that, read that story. Right. And there are many, many others as well. But... The girl, uh, <laughs> continue with this one. Uh, girl from Barcelona, girl on the run. Um, basically, um, continues the story right through. It turns out to be... So these are, this trilogy is that, which is the number one? Number one is the, the girl from Barcelona. Okay. You can hold that. Yeah. If you don't mind. Thank yeah. you. Then it's girl on the run. Okay. And that's where Daniela is, steals a lot of money. That's Her name is Daniela. Daniela, that's right. Yeah, and okay. Uh, she's stolen a lot of money as a police officer. She's stolen a, a, a lot of money that has been put together in a slush fund um, in Spain um, for a coup attempt. Okay, but she's managed to get it. It's a billion euros. A billion euros, about 600. Still being connected to Al-Qaeda. Still being connected, but we never quite know what her motivation is or what her agenda is. Right. Now, don't forget, her parents have been killed. Do we know who pushes the buttons for her? Well, we think we do. Yeah. And that's the interesting thing, because there's so many twists and turns. Right. But remember that her parents are killed in an actual event, which was the... Um, the Atoka train bombing in 2004, March 11th, 2004. Okay. And she was eight at that time. Yeah. So you can start to think of the psychology behind this young lady. She goes up deep undercover at 17 with Al-Qaeda. And I, I don't tell you too much of the story because... It, yeah, yeah. But it also ties in with the CIA operation, um, which is targeting the head of the, the Al-Qaeda organization. So there is... You go from Spain, not just in Spain, but it's uh, also North Africa, um, Syria, uh, places I've been, um, Turkey, um, Iraq, and also comes back to Washington, D.C., where there's a deep state type of linkage. And that's all I can tell you because I've got a so, small story. So what you're saying then is that if you really want to do justice to the story has a lot of real history behind mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. but you should read all three of them. Yes, right? you should. Because that once you start with uh, the first one, the girl from Barcelona, then you will have yeah. a good idea about the foundation, but it will automatically push you towards the second one. Exactly. And the, girl, uh, the second one is the girl on, on the run, and then uh, the third one is uh, with vengeance. Yes. Is is the try? Is it, are the, are you planning other books? In the, uh, is this the story of Daniela, or are there more to follow? Yeah, more to follow. More yeah. to follow. Uh, book four is well underway, um, and uh, thank you, John. And um, I've also written a couple of other books, which have been on the shelf for a time. Uh, which I'd like to, uh, to bring out and into publication. 
It's a lot of work, as you know, because when you're writing books, John, as you know, you also have to promote them, market them uh, at the same time. Uh, that's a lot of work, and you've got a wonderful setup here, and I think uh, uh, you do incredibly well at it. Um, but it, it is a lot of work, as you. And and then you your own publisher. Yes. And the publishing company has a history behind it again too, because mm -hmm. it goes back to your grandparents in right. and, and England. Right. Really, the name of it. But the uh, but what I found is with. Uh, I always love to write. But once you do, then the question becomes: What should it look like? What's the size of the book? Should it be? Uh, hard copy should it be soft copy should it be but what's the the front of the book because what but attracts the buyer to the book is the visual appearance of the external part of the book you're absolutely right absolutely right so important and also the distribution which you know about yours is available i think on amazon i think uh, correct my books are available through uh, amazon as well uh, also they're distributed globally by Ingram. Uh, we've talked about that yeah. uh, before. Um, they're also available through Indigo here in Canada, Chapters, Coles. Yeah. And Are you doing a presentation at Indigo locally? Yes, uh, we're doing that tomorrow. We've got a book uh, a signing at uh, Coles. Where, where is Indigo located? In, in, in the, uh, Pine Center? Yes. Uh, Pine Center yeah, yeah. Mall, right on the front part. Very, very uh, yeah. excellent bookstore. It is. It really is good. And Indigo has been absolutely terrific. Uh, in the States, we work with Barnes & Noble, um, Waterstones in the UK. So uh, it's all about distribution as well. You've got to get your books out there. Uh, that, yeah. yeah. And, and you distribute it globally? Yes, it is. Through Ingram, it's a global distribution. We distribute uh, particularly in Spain, UK. Middle East is growing, um, and I think the, remember that there are print books, e-books, and I don't know if you've done audio books yet. You should I, do I, audio books. All of them are audio. Excellent. They're fantastic. Yeah. And I, I, I do it myself. Excellent. Yeah, I've, I found it interesting uh, with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, you know, and I'm mm. a fan, <laughs> you know, because uh, I'm bodybuilding, but uh, that's a not different issue. But I also admire him for the things that he does, most yeah. of the things that he does. And then, uh, you know, he wrote a book, and then he did the audio, but he just did a small portion of the audio, and then somebody else did the rest. And only, and I have said, why would he do that? Because yeah. I believe it's so important <clears throat> to do it yourself. Yeah. Then I found out that he has, how do you call it when somebody has difficulty reading? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the, uh, anyway, so yeah, yeah. He, he was quite candid about it that he said he had difficulty. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he still did it anyway. Just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that part again <clears throat> is very important. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's good, it's good. And, and uh, uh, brilliant. I, I do want to say while we've still got a chance that I, I do want to, you know, just compliment you on what you have been doing on your show here because it's terrific. It's so well balanced. It has a lot of good resource industry stuff like the forest industry, the background that we share and you're still very active in. Um, but I think what you're doing is a, not just a service for Prince George and the local community. You, you're doing a fantastic job, John, for uh, through your podcasts in terms of bringing in very knowledgeable people, experienced people, and capturing those thought processes which are going to go forwards in your video, audio, video, video scenes. And I think uh, that's just terrific the way you're doing it. Uh, you know, uh, we go back to that theme again in the forest industry about managing the transition. I, I think you've had some terrific guests on, on your show. Yeah. And I, I think you're doing a great job in that. And you're one of them, uh, Peter. Oh, you thank know, you. And, and then <laughs> obviously what makes uh, you and me so unique is that, uh, you know, and then one hour is uh, not, uh, not enough time. And I hope to bring you back at some point again or keep you involved is that, uh, yeah, p podcasting uh, uh, was, was something more by coincidence than anything else. As I told you mm -hmm. earlier, I was involved with Shaw. Uh, you know, f before COVID, did about 35 sessions on BC forest industry in transition to a certain extent, or uh, history of BC forest industry. Then say, 
COVID came, we couldn't do that anymore. So what do we do now? I had this apartment and then uh, we said together, let's do it here. Yeah. And then we want to make sure that, uh, you know, it started off slowly. <clears throat> And then we want to make sure that the equipment is right that we have. Yep. And we have an excellent team uh, around us. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, it takes time to build it up. And then the guest that I have is not a number of issues that are important to me is the, to talk about uh, ADHD, but it's not solely about that. And trauma potentially and in the educational system is important the other one is the forest industry and the other one is uh, motivating people in terms of uh, uh, opportunities and and uh, you know and believing in themselves and and the opportunities that exist mm -hmm. in the world really mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and if I look at podcasting podcasting and and social media has is still on its infancy yep it's Absolutely. still only beginning and uh, mm -hmm. you know the uh, and podcast uh, match is uh, an organization that uh, around the world uh, uh, has podcast guests involved and podcasters involved a whole group probably well in excess of 20,000 and uh, just today we got uh, a message from the president of the organization that we are in the, the top one percent globally of well podcasters done. Amazing. Yep. No, no, no. More innovation by John Brink. <laughs> yeah. No, I, <laughs> no, I'm serious. But it's all I'm the serious. team. Yeah. Because you still keep innovating. Yeah. Fantastic. Well done. Well done. You know, it's an absolute pleasure seeing you again. And uh, it's a privilege to, uh, to know you. Yeah. And yeah. so where do you go from here, Peter? Because you are, yeah. you, you have such an amazing background in, yeah. in the stories that you have. Uh, you know, the, and obviously you're still too young to retire really <laughs> is that uh, you, uh, the love of your life is writing and yeah, you're very yeah. very good at it so that will yeah. be a big part of your life yeah. then being a professional speaker yeah. is uh, a yeah. part of your yeah. life and yeah. uh, and and the same as me is doing writing being a professional speaker obviously I'm still involved very much involved in the lumber industry and uh, at 83, I'll be 83 <laughs> in about two months from now. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm writing another book I have to tell you about. It's the <laughs> one that I'm writing now, comes out in June. Oh, Living That's young, dying old. Oh, <laughs> and, and, and saying that, what does that mean? It, yeah. To me, what is very important is quality of life. Yeah. Not so, yeah. A lot of people say by the time you're 45, well, I'm too old for this, I'm too old for that. No, you know, no, no. So, no. Ridiculous. And, and, and so I, that yeah. book will come out in June. Excellent. And the other part, very much part of my life, I've wor worked on it for a long time, is uh, uh, BC's forest industry history as to where we have been and where the future lies. Yep, yep. And that book will come out in September. That's right. And it's all very much about giving back what you do in wonderful yeah. ways. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Peter, my pleasure. pleasure. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having me. Nice job. Take care. You too.